it's time for another story. I bet you're wondering, why am I dressed like this? Suspenders with a Superman t-shirt. It's kind of a strange outfit, don't you think? Well, this outfit reminds me of one of my favorite movies of all time. It's called The Goonies. The movie's about a bunch of kids that go on a treasure hunt. So they go on an adventure. And in the movie, they meet a very large, strange-looking character by the name of Sloth. Now, Sloth wore this outfit. He had a Superman t-shirt and he had suspenders. And he, is, he was my favorite character in that whole movie. Very strange-looking man, but he's big and strong and he's actually a very lovable and gentle guy once you see that movie. The reason why I'm wearing this is because the story that I'm going to read to you is about another group of characters that are going to go on an adventure. This story is called The Last Basilope. It's written and illustrated by Berkeley Breathed, and it's published by The Little Brown and Company. I hope you enjoy it. It's a great adventure story. The Last Basilope, one ferocious story. Written and illustrated by Berkeley Breathed, published by Little Brown and Company. A very terribly long time ago, before such things as television and good table manners or even children, ferocious monsters roamed a younger, angrier world. Whispered legends tell of a race of razor-horned, slobbery-fanged beasts more ferocious than the others. The stories say that the mere sight of one of them in a dinosaur neighborhood would inspire rip-snorting dinosaur pandemonium lasting for weeks. Stories also say that a few of these brutes survived those terrible times. They say that just beyond our backyards, deep within the forest gloom, the very last one of them is still hiding, snarling, eating grizzly bears whole, and waiting to be discovered. They call him the Last Basilope. Nobody read these Basilope stories more closely than a great and famous discoverer named Opus. Now, in truth, Opus was neither great nor famous and had discovered precisely no spotted tigers, no people-eating toads, and generally no lost tribes of Nebraskan cannibals. Even this morning, he couldn't discover two clean socks. But he was hopeful. Surely, he thought, a great and famous discoverer, such as himself, would soon discover something. And a razor-horned, slobbery-fanged basilope seemed a properly ferocious something. An expedition must be formed. Opus found his best friends, Bill the house cat, Milk Toast the house bug, and Ronald Ann the house kid, watching TV in his living room. Several TVs, actually. Opus flung open the front door and pointed out into the sunshine. The great Basilope expedition is forming outside, he announced. Ferocious things are still out there. Undiscovered things. Wonderful things. Ronald Ann pointed out that there was a commercial for tidy nose allergy spray on TV, which seemed wonderful enough, thank you. Volunteers, please, form an orderly line outside. No pushing, ordered the expedition leader. But they didn't form any line whatsoever, so he had to drag each of the volunteers out. Ronald Ann twice, by the feet. When Opus finally explained that they would all get on TV once the basilope was captured, attitudes improved. He assigned responsibilities to each of the expedition members. Bill the Cat would carry the survival gear. Milk Toast would watch for elephants and act as manager once they got famous. And Ronald Ann would prepare the marshmallow gummy bear milkshakes. Bill discovered some scraps of cardboard and an old set of cow horns in some nearby trash and danced around like a basilope, amusing all but the expedition leader. Bill was scolded for goofing off and felt thoroughly useless. We're off, announced Opus, 
and with a mail order basilope net in hand, he led the group out the back gate and down toward the massive trees beyond. They walked deep into the gloom of the ancient forest for many, many miles. The air was deathly still, except for the unseen wings of unseen things gliding through the creeping mist. The great Basilope expeditionary force was lost. Then, at their feet, they suddenly noticed an endless glowing carpet of dandelion puffs stretching in all directions. Stranger still, a mysterious path had been cut through this miniature white forest. Opus bent down for a closer look. The dandelion tops, he whispered, have been whacked clean off. Whacked? shrieked Ronald Ann, horrified. Clean off, repeated Opus. By razor-sharp horns, guessed Milk Toast. The basilope has been through here, said the expedition leader nervously. They followed the dandelion path into the distance. That evening in camp, nobody really enjoyed their marshmallow gummy bear ketchup milkshakes. It's never easy enjoying a good meal if one expects to be eaten soon oneself. Opus tucked Ronald Ann under her blanket and then settled himself in. Bill stood guard in his underwear and tried to feel useful. Milk Toast put some cold cream on his face and retired, only to jump up, hollering that there was a bug under his blanket. He calmed down when Opus pointed out that it was just himself. In the flickering firelight, Opus thought he saw horrible basilope shapes lurking nearby. He inched his hand out from under the blanket and held a deadly weapon at the ready. It was a long time before he fell asleep. Opus awoke in the morning when a single tiny dandelion wisp landed gently on his nose, making him sneeze. The others awoke to find more of the little white tufts floating from the direction of a strange glow just beyond view. Sleepily, they dressed and crept toward the edge of a deep clearing. Peering into the light, they didn't notice the other creatures of the forest, frozen in fear, gazing at the sight below. Look, whispered Opus. Ronald Ann held her breath. Bill hid his face. Milk Toast ran in the opposite direction, screaming. Opus tiptoed closer. A single shaft of morning sun pierced the thick forest canopy and fell square upon a shining grassy meadow. In the middle stood the fierce, the terrible, the last basilope. Opus did not see any slobbery fangs, nor did he see any razor horns. In fact, the beast seemed to be humming. And he certainly wasn't eating grizzly bears whole, he was nibbling off the tops of dandelions. Nibbling? Opus sputtered. This isn't what I call ferocious. The basilope looked up. His nose began to quiver. Both lips curled up into a horrible snarl, revealing rows of dripping teeth. The monster began to lumber toward them. Uh-oh said the great, but not especially brave, discoverer. Retreat! Fall back! Backpedal! commanded Opus. The entire Basilope expeditionary force went into full throttle, no brakes, darn the torpedoes, reverse! They shot out into a huge open meadow, the spitting, snorting creature following close behind. Opus collapsed, exhausted, on the other side and found himself cowering under a massive shadow of dripping teeth and quivering basilope lips. How embarrassing, he thought, for a famous discoverer to die as a basilope snack. The jaws gaped. The monster drew in his lungs for a final dandelion-filled breath. And then... He sneezed. 
Oh, not a normal sneeze. Not a run-of-the-mill, namby-pamby, plain-jane, everyday reverse sniffle like yours or mine. No, this was a 10-megaton bull moose nasal explosion propelling the creature backward in a graceful arc through the sky. With a plop, the basilope landed neatly on his bottom, very much as though he'd had some practice at all of this. Snuffling, the basilope reached down with one of his huge ears and grasped a leaf with which he blew his nose. Gesundheit, the beast said. Thank you, he replied to himself. He smiled shyly at the expedition members and massaged his stuffy nose. Dandelions always do that to basilopes, he said. We really shouldn't eat them, but we do love them so. The great basilope expeditionary force cautiously walked over to the sniffling creature. The last basilope, I presume? asked Opus as formally as he could. The beast lifted his right ear and held it out to shake. Personal acquaintances call me Rosebud, he said. At least they would if I had any, the creature added with a sigh. We basilopes have been trying to make some for, oh, 200 million years, but we've never been very good at it. Then Rosebud grasped a dandelion stalk with an ear and inhaled the wisps with a snort. Again, his lips began to curl and his nose wrinkled into a ferocious sneer. Opus shrank back in horror. Bill covered his eyes. But Ronald Ann pulled out a small spray bottle from her pocket. She squirted the stuff into the basilope's twitching, snarling honker, which then immediately unsnarled. The bottle read, Tidy Nose Allergy Spray. Maybe personal acquaintances will be easier to make now, said Ronald Ann, smiling. You can start with us. And to celebrate, they spent the rest of the day collecting huge numbers of dandelions for a grand feast. Actually, only Rosebud did the eating. The others jumped into the pile. Suddenly, Rosebud pricked up his ears. A noise came from deep within the forest, a noise unlike he'd heard before. Everyone turned to look. An avalanche of honking, roaring, squealing cars and trucks burst from the forest. Written across their sides were the names of TV shows and satellite networks and newspapers and magazines and animal zoos and tour companies. And there, hanging on to the hood ornament of the lead vehicle, was former expedition member Milk Toast the Housebug, pointing the way. We've got him cornered, he hollered. Bring him back alive. Rosebud turned to Opus. More acquaintances? he asked, hopefully. Many, many more, said Opus, looking worried. He thought for a second and then turned to Bill. We have to work fast, he said to the cat. The parade of cars and trucks roared across the meadow. They surrounded the great basilope expeditionary force, and a mob of screaming people leapt out, carrying cameras, microphones, and cages. Milk Toast motioned for silence. I told you all how I captured the monster, said the housebug grandly, and now if you'll just spell my name right in the newspapers, he's all yours. Then Opus and Ronald Ann stepped aside to reveal, well, a very unusual beast. Nobody in the crowd noticed, but this basilope had wieners for horns, tomatoes for eyeballs, and two bananas for fangs. To Milk Toast, the monster looked suspiciously like a cat wearing his lunch. The crowd exploded into a blur of whirring cameras and shouted questions. Milk Toast screamed, We're being hoodwinked! But nobody heard. Opus and Ronald Ann slinked away as the crowd closed in on the beast. The two reached Rosebud, who was hiding under the pile of dandelions, far away from the shouting crowd. I think you'd better leave now, Opus told the basilope softly. Ronald Ann kissed Rosebud on the nose and slipped him a small spray bottle. Delighted to have made your acquaintance, she whispered. 
Rosebud hugged her with his huge ears, and then she ran off to help Bill with the mob. Opus handed Rosebud a last snack for the road. A great and famous discoverer knows that some secrets are better left undiscovered, Opus said sadly. Then I have one more undiscovery, said the beast, just for you. He scrunched up his eyes, and his face turned pink with strain. Slowly at first, and then quickly, his antlers expanded like glowing balloons. They rose above his head, and gently, ever so gently, Rosebud's feet lifted off the ground. The stories never mention this, said a thrilled Opus, laughing and waving goodbye. A trail of dandelion wisps danced in the last glow of sunlight as Rosebud drifted gracefully toward a deeper, more distant part of the forest. He hoped that ahead might be a quieter place, certainly a less ferocious place. He looked back at the tiny figure still waving far below, and he smiled. He smiled because it occurred to him that after a very terribly long time, the world's last basilope was actually the world's first basilope with friends. That was a great story. I hope you liked it. The basilope wasn't a mean, ferocious creature like they thought at the beginning of the story. He was actually quite loving and gentle and, and friendly. It reminds me of Sloth from the Goonies, like I said before. He was kind of strange looking and scary looking, but when you get to know him, he was actually pretty loving and gentle and friendly. So Rosebud the Basilope and Sloth from the Goonies are very similar in their character. How cool is that? Well, I hope you enjoyed the book. And I think right now I'm going to go watch one of my favorite movies, The Goonies. Have a great day, everybody.